All right, so welcome to CMX. Just so you know a little bit about who I am, I'm David Spinks. I'm the founder of CMX. I've uh, built three startups, so CMX is actually my third company. Um, I started a company called Feast before this, and way back in the day, I started another company called Blogdash. And everything I've, I always do, wh whatever the topic is, it always has to do with community. I'm a mentor of 500 startups and startup Chile. But really, I'm this guy. I know, it's embarrassing. This is me in middle school. And uh, I struggled to find a sense of community when I was a kid. I hopped from group to group. I was cons. I played sports. I tried different friend groups. I, I had a lot of falling outs. And I really struggled. My social life just kind of sucked when I was a kid. And it really, it was, it was a tough time. And uh, I actually found it in a very unusual and unexpected place with the hardcore music scene. Who knows what the hardcore music scene is? All right, we'll catch up later, exchange some bands. So hardcore is like, you're all thinking like, is that like metal? No, it's like even like worse than that. Um, like the mosh pits, they don't push, they're like punching each other. I actually broke my jaw once, shattered it in three places at a show, and then decided it was a good idea to go back into the mosh pit. Blame it on community. Um, but the, the sense of community I got from being a part of that scene, from the people, the sense of belonging, the identity, it's the first time that I can remember in my life where I really started to identify who I was and I got to explore who I really was. And it was, like, it was a vivid awakening for me. And that experience of struggling to find community for so long and, and then finally finding it, if, if I had a therapist, he'd probably tell you that's why I, I enjoy bringing community to other people so much. And it's, it's what's driven me to become obsessed with understanding how to build communities, why some people feel like they belong, some people don't, what goes into a sense of belonging. And, and I've, I've been studying this stuff, I've been learning it, I've been doing it professionally, and it set me on my mission, which is basically to help every single willing person and organization in the world become a better community builder. So like, I've, I'm never as excited as I am at these CMX summits to see you all here. All the, people, all the people in the world who are passionate about building communities, and if we can help you and send you away with a little bit better uh, perspective, a little bit more perspective, a little bit more clarity around how to build communities, like, I'm, I'm happy. Like, my life is going well. So thanks, for, first of all, for being here. Um, it's a good time for me to be obsessed with community because that shit is on fleek. If you don't know what on fleek means, I recommend you look it up. Urban Dictionary. Um, community is really hot right now. I think the reason it happens is for two reasons. Mostly because of technology. And technology has made it easier for people to communicate with each other, which has made them have a higher expectation of organizations. And, and uh, organizations have had to become more customer centric. They have to actually care about people, right? They actually have to focus on the emotional stuff, not just on delivering a product. And also, it's become easier for companies to distribute control. And that's, you know, we see all these collaborative consumption organizations, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, all these technology tools that are allowing us to empower people to contribute in new ways that were never before possible. And it's really brought this attention back to community. Really, it's about how do you motivate people? How do you get them excited? How do you empower them and distribute control to them? And as a result, there are a lot of companies who are really interested in community. And even if they misunderstand it, it's still a good thing. I want to reiterate, even if they don't understand it, it's still a good thing. If they have no idea what the hell we do, that's OK. We'll teach them. That's why we're here. We're here to define it and figure this stuff out. But the fact that companies are starting to be more focused on community and be more community conscious is a really good thing. And we're in a really great time right now. If the world just all moves in a direction where we're actually thinking about building communities and not just uh, exchanges and not just transactions, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. But as an industry right now, we're faced with three major challenges. And you may have experienced these yourself. One, there's a lack of definition. What do we do? How do we do it? Where does it fit in an organization? How do you define being a community professional? How do you define the community industry? Unclear value. We feel the value, but it's unclear. It's, it's hard to explain. It's hard to describe. It's hard to justify an investment in it. And the third one, maybe the biggest one, 
is an unsupportive culture. We find ourselves in organizations who, if they don't believe in it, they don't understand it on a core level, the culture isn't built on community, it's really hard to, to, to do good work. And so these are the three challenges that, you know, since starting CMX and since I started as a community professional almost a decade ago, it's the same three challenges and I'm constantly thinking about like, how do we solve these problems? How do we solve these problems? And we have these conversations and I, I meet thousands of companies now who are investing in community, a lot of them very successfully. I'm trying to identify a trend. And recently, I had kind of an aha moment. Basically, I, I, I recognized a framework that I believe truly represents what a community-driven organization is. You guys want to hear it? The people up there? Oh. Hey, what's up? Is that Brian? All right. All right, fine, I'll tell you. So, this is the traditional organization, right? You have a vision. Someone has an idea, a spark. Maybe it's one person. It's a singular point in time. It's a pixel. And somebody has that vision, and then they build a team around that vision. People believe in the vision. And so that person distributes some control to these people who are now contributing in all these different ways. And then, of course, you have your audience. You start thinking about who's our audience? What are we building for? Who are we building for? And this is what's interesting is, and this is admittedly how I've been thinking about community in a lot of ways as well, is then you have your community in there. And the important thing to recognize here is there are two separate entities. You have your team, the employees, the people who are paid, and then you have the audience, the community, the people that you're, you're serving in a way. So a lot of stuff's going on in that team, right? Things are moving around. You're not really sure what's happening. People are working, and then once in a while, a product comes out or a service. And the audience and the community can respond to that product or service. Maybe they buy it. Maybe they don't. Maybe they love it. Maybe they hate it. They send feedback. They send criticism. And then it gets shot back into that team, and a bunch of shit keeps happening. And then like a year later, like, it poops out another product. And then the audience and the community can respond again, and it's that cycle. And, and that's how we traditionally think about organizations. And honestly, this is how I've also often thought about it, right? We have our team and then there's a community that we're serving. Here's what the community-driven organization looks like. And this came from, uh, uh, I spent two days with our closing keynote, David Marquette, um, who trains leader, people on leadership, on how to distribute control within your organization, on, on it's called intent-based leadership, right? So the people who are responsible for specific things within the organization. They have the ability to make decisions on what they're doing. You're gonna hear all about, you're gonna hear all about that later on in his closing keynote. And as we were talking, he was talking about distributing control internally to your team, and I was talking about, okay, externally, what are we doing to build the community? And then it kind of clicked that we're talking about the same thing. It's all one entity. And this has profound implications. It's so simple. All you're doing is saying instead of it's them and then us, you're saying a company is one collective entity. It's one continuum. And the two major implications that I found from that are one, your team is the core of the community. How many people here look at your team as a community? About half, some shaky hands. Right before this moment, do you ever think about it? But look at all the things that go into a community. Collaboration, sense of belonging, sense of identity, common interests. Sometimes you're in the same space. You're all working together towards a common goal. Your team is a community. And based on this, it's not just a community, it's the core of your community. Your power users aren't necessarily the core of your community. Your customers aren't necessarily the core, it's your team. And without a healthy core, without a healthy community on your team, how can you possibly expect to have a healthy community externally? The second major implication is that community and audience just becomes an extension of your team. So it's no longer we have our team 
and then there's the audience and the community, it's one continuum, right? From the core out, the vision happens. A CEO, a founder comes up with a vision and then they distribute control to the team who's getting rewarded maybe by salary or benefits or equity or whatever it is and they're all working towards it. But then we stop there and we say, okay, now we have customers and we're shipping out to customers. And a community-driven organization doesn't stop at the team. They see it as a continuum, right? They're just distributing control further. I'll explain. It's all about control, reward, and commitment, right? This is inspired by the commitment curve. If you're familiar with the commitment curve, usually it's, it's time and commitment, and over time you wanna ask for more commitment from people. But what I see when it comes to how organizations are structured is it's all on a continuum of control, reward, and commitment, right? Your team, your CEO, they have the highest commitment, the highest reward, and the highest control over the direction of the organization, right? And then the team around the CEO or the team around the executive, a little bit less reward, a little bit less control, a little bit less commitment maybe. And then you continue, right, to the community. There's still a level of control and reward and commitment that your community has, right? It's just different from your team instead of benefits or or salary, maybe they're still getting paid, or maybe it's just a sense of belonging. Maybe it's uh, an emotional reward. So if you look at it on, on here, it all comes down to con commitment, control, reward. In the middle, you have the highest commitment, the highest control, the highest reward, and as you work out, you have the lowest commitment, the lowest control, and lowest reward all the way out. And this, this could keep going. So you have your team, you have your community, then you have your audience, and then what, what else? Maybe you have your entire market or the entire world, right? You can continue on this continuum. And even your audience has some level of control, some level of commitment, some level of reward. It's a continuum. It's one entity. Your community is an extension of your team. They are working for you. It's just a different reward. It's not them and then us. It's we. And it all comes down, so when we actually look at the value, so you're distributing control, you're giving people control and rewarding them for doing something. You have product. They may be helping you develop your product, create your product, give you feedback on your product. Maybe they are your product. I'll give you some examples after this. You have support. So maybe they're helping each other. You're distributing control and empowering them to support each other and make each other more successful, answer each other's questions, give each other feedback, give each other ideas. Or it's growth. You're empowering them and giving them control to spread the vision, to bring more people in. Maybe they're evangelizing. Maybe they're ambassadors. Maybe they're referrals, affiliates, whatever it is. That's all focused on growth. So every single community program, everything I've seen, can all be boiled down into these three things. So if you're thinking about the value of community, where community might fit into your organization, think about what are people want to do that you can empower them to do? How can they work for you? And what is the reward and motivation that's going to make them committed? Do they want to help contribute to the product, support, or growth? And you're going to see all three of these things today and see actually how it's done from other speakers. To give you a few examples, look at Airbnb. At the core, there's a team. The community has hosts. The audience is more guests, right? Are the hosts employees? No. Are they members of the team? Are they working for Airbnb? Maybe. The lines are blurring between team and community and audience. It's all one continuum. Salesforce, they approach it from a marketing or growth perspective. They have their MVP program and they can actually track how many of their MVPs refer other people to the program. Are MVPs working for them? No, they're actually customers. They're not paid by them, they're paying them. But by empowering them and giving them rewards and control, they're actually contributing to their vision. They're continuing the vision. Apple, they have their support forms. The people who respond on their form, the people who are moderating, are they working for them? No, but they're contrib tri contributing value. They distributed control to those people to be able to contribute to this thing. 
Apple also has a product community, right? If you have an iPhone, how many of your apps are developed by Apple? How many are developed by their community of app, develop, app developers? And that community, they're all helping each other, figuring out how to build better apps, how to promote their apps, how to be better on the marketplace, right? So Apple could have created all of, the, all of their apps themselves, but what really differentiated Apple from the beginning with their iPhone was the App Store, and that was created by a community. It's a distributed model. Wikipedia. They have a team that has to build the website, build the structure, build the guide rails, but the editors are the ones who are actually creating the content. They're creating the product. It's a distributed model. And every single organization in the world has an opportunity to embrace the same things that work for Wikipedia, that work for Firefox, that work for social networks. It's understanding how to distribute control to people in a way that they want to contribute, how to motivate them properly, and give them the proper rewards. This isn't anything new, right? Companies actually started as communities. If you look at the etymology of, of, of uh, company, which David Marquette also inspired me to look up, um, is companion. It was breaking bread. Your trade guild would come into town and you'd sit down for dinner and you'd exchange goods and interact with each other and there was a community. That's how the word company was formed. Companies are communities. But at some point through industrialization and scaling product development, it, it, it became more of this transactional relationship. But now because of that technology, how it's improved our ability to communicate with each other, it's going back to the roots of community. And I joke around that we're the only industry with about two million years of research to look for. Right? We survived as a human species because of community. It's literally wired into us. Like, you had to find a community in order to survive. And if that community cut you out, you're dead. <laughs> you're screwed. And that's still wired into us. Somewhere deep down in there, we're still functioning on that same level. Right? So can you imagine if you can give people a sense of community that taps into that survival instinct? They're never going to leave your organization. That's going to create loyal, unrivaled loyalty. Right? So look at what's worked in community for millions of years and think about what's the true motivators, how do you distribute control, how do you distribute reward, how do you give people that real sense of belonging. So to go back to the three major challenges, we have lack of definition, we have unclear value, we have unsupportive culture. Lack of definition, I hope this helps. Where does community sit in an organization? Community is this Central piece. It starts at your core. It's your vision. It's your team. You may be working internally to build community, or you can be working to distribute control. Your job is to distribute control, figure out motivations and rewards, and bringing people together in order to help them better succeed at the work that you're distributing to them. Right? I think this brings a, for me, this brought so much clarity around what community, how it's actually defined in an organization. Unclear value. Product, support, growth. Everything falls into one of those three things. Right? So if you have to prove the value, figure out under which one of those three things it really falls. And I know uh, the next talk you're going to hear a lot more about ROI and actually get into the details. But on a really high level, you're either helping grow it, you're helping support it, or you're actually helping develop it. Right? Those are the only three things. And then unsupportive culture. Anybody have a solution for that? Shit. <laughs> I joke around that like most of the organizations that come to me and ask for help with community are actually, uh, they need organizational change help. And I'm just like, you're gonna have to hire uh, somebody else. Um, really, you have two options. You have to recognize that if, as a culture, your organization is not supporting community and what you do, that you have to take on the, the project of changing your organization. If you're not up for that, quit and find a new job where you can actually find a culture that supports community. Honestly, right? They're going to be the, com the companies that believe in it and, and, and look at it uh, in this way, right? They're, they're going to be aligned to see community as a core part of their business, starting from their vision, working out to their team, working out to their community, or they're still going to look at it in a traditional way. They're just going to expect you to actually do marketing. You're not going to be able to do real community work. And so either you have to be working on organizational change or just find a company where it's already a belief.
because it is changing. And I see every single day I get to talk to companies that truly get community, that are investing it in the right way. There are more jobs out there every day. And we're creating that movement right here at CMX Summit. This will leave you with this quote from Rob Hayes. Um, Rob has invested in Uber and so many community-centric companies. He's from First Round Capital. And, and he said, community makes your product indestructible. In a day and age where products are easier and easier to make, everyone knows how to code, it's easier, out of, more out-of-the-box solutions, you have all these different ways to develop products, the one thing that differentiates you and defines you is your community. It's the one thing that no competitor, nobody can ever copy. And if you tap into that survival instinct, you'll create unrivaled loyalty and it will make your product and your company indestructible. Let's do this. <laughs>